Well, good evening. I tell you what, though, Gerald, that was an act of faith, those meatballs, mate. What, the meatballs? The meatballs, yeah. It's a miracle. Absolute miracle. I don't know whether you heard about the... Uh... I suppose there are two switches. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The meatballs was an amazing act of faith. And all, just think all over the camp, people are, are extending this sort of faith. There were actually two cows heard talking just behind the site. And, and one said, I'm really concerned about this BSE. And the other cow said, doesn't worry me, I'm a squirrel. <coughs> and the joke went on for heifer and heifer. Yeah. <laughs> Jack. Jack Cleverly, can you come up here, please? Where are you? Young Jack, give him a hand of applause. Right, after everything has gone on, we Oh, a seat! A seat! Right. Now, some folks have been saying it's a pressure this week. I'm now on. I'm now on. I'm now oh. on. Two switches. I'm, yeah, there are two switches. Right, okay. Jack, <laughs> folks have been saying this week there's been a pressure, but has it? Um, no. <laughs> Good. So how have you felt about things since? Uh, it's been pretty amazing. Oh. Well, give us a clue. <laughs> uh, um, I've never. Oh, it's, it's, I've never really experienced something like that, like what happened two nights ago before. So it's really something new, which has confirmed my faith in God. So you're really looking forward to what's going to happen next? Yeah. <laughs> I, I hear you've been out, Jack, and bought a couple of things. Is it today? Beef chalk and uh, new fibre and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I the, yep. yeah, I bought the youth bible and um, some phrase mix. Things like that. Thanks ever so much. Very and well done. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> God bless. We. Uh, we appreciate the concern. Various folk have said, uh, you know, has it been a pressure to that young man? And uh, David just thought it'd be good to get him up and ask him a few questions. And uh, one or two on the team have had a time with him and his parents. And uh, he said, no, it just confirmed what God had already put in my heart. So it was a very wonderful thing. So what yeah, if, uh, we've what got some notices. We have indeed. Can I just give an extra on tonight? Go for it. Because uh, obviously uh, there have been various things going up on the overheads either side. But there is another extra tonight on being filled with the Spirit. And uh, we did that the night before last, and it was such a helpful time for people that along with what's happening here with the waves and one or two other things that are going on, as you can see with your screens, we're doing another being filled with the Spirit. It'll be led by Rob White and Charlie Cleverly and a number of others. It's a further time of teaching, of waiting, of refreshing, and it's at 9.30, and it's in the Enchanted Castle. Okay, and um, we've got a notice about left luggage. If you want to dump your gear, because you've got to be out your chalets, from 8.30 tomorrow morning until 1 p.m., there's a left luggage just beyond the beach club. It'll be supervised from 8.30 to 1 p.m. After that, you're on your own. And uh, tonight is the last opportunity to visit the resources centre and the service area. It's going to be open for us until 11.30 at night. If you have visited the resources area, would you raise your hand, please? Whoa, look at this, very good. Well, this is the last opportunity to have a bit of a look, a bit of a look round, and also to order your tapes or your videos, and you can do that right up until 12 midnight tonight. And again, when you're thinking of tapes and videos, don't just think of yourself, but it may be the leadership of your church, it may be some young people you're working with, you want to train up. There are certain key things that have been said throughout the week that you might feel, that is what I want them to hear. And what Pete Meadows is going to be sharing tonight is something that I think every church should have a copy of. It's to do with the workplace and what we do from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. And not only then. Right. And tonight there's a, another opportunity for giving uh, in, in the worship. And tonight it's going to be to support the Ministry of Evangelism. So anything to do with evangelism, then you've got that opportunity tonight. And just as you're doing that, remember that vicar who told his congregation that... Uh, he said, I've got some good news and some bad news for you tonight. The good news is that we've got the money that we need for the evangelism. The bad news is it's still in your pockets.
I think that was the same vicar who said, because it's Easter, we're going to ask Mrs. Brown to come and lay an egg on the altar. Is that the one? Sounds yeah. very familiar. So, sounds the same one. Um, tomorrow morning, which is the last morning we're here together, there'll be a choice of two uh, communions. There's the family communion with Ishmael and company, which is from 9.30 until 10.30. And then there is the showboat communion here, 9.30 till 11.30. There'll be no communion in the junior show place. So it's family communion with Ishmael and co, 9.30 to 10.30. Showboat communion here, 9.30 to 11.30. And there's no communion in the junior show place. Well, we now have someone rather special we need to introduce, don't we? Mr. Simpkins. Mr. Simpkins. Now, he is a nameless wonder, isn't he, really? Absolutely amazing. Whilst all this goes on from one week to another, and indeed on, on, on several sites over the years, uh, there is a certain man who is the chairman of Spring Harvest, and he is responsible for the team that run it all throughout the whole of the year and get everything together for us. And uh, he, he's like a member of MI5 and MI6. We speak of him in hushed tones. He signs the checks. And I want you to welcome a very important man. His name is Mr. Simpkins. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Simpkins, what, what do you do during the year? I mean, uh, well, I go around finding out people's names, and uh, I found out your other name is Reg. Is that true? <laughs> it's not true, but you see, every day I get a, a sheet giving me what we're doing from one night to another, and, and I notice here that, that, that what they call the Sting magazine slot, which is this here, it's Dave, which is him, and Reg. Now, the reason this happened was because a few days ago, uh, after I'd spoken, uh, Somebody went up to my wife, not realising it was my wife, and said, I've got a message for Reg. And Anona thought she was into the occult, you know. And um, so Anona said, I don't think I need to hear that. So she said, no, Reg, who spoke tonight? And she said, that, he's Gerald. See, well, he looks like a Reg. So, <laughs> so it's true. So ever since then, I've been Reg to the senior leadership team. And Reg, Reg Varney or somebody like that? On the buses. Yes. I, I don't really know. David, have you got a contribution to make it? I just wondered what you had in common with the number plate. <laughs> I'm up to date. <laughs> uh, actually, we have got a very serious thing to put to you, Mr. Simpkins. You know, the, you know this couple who are 80 years of age? <laughs> well, this is the man. This is, this is <laughs> the man. Thank you very much. That, 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 was, that was unfair because because, uh, because Mr. Simpkins is a bit older than that. Um, <laughs> no, there, this, this couple that uh, 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 they got engaged just before they came here. I know you don't believe this, but there are two people on this site. They're 80 years of age. They're right there in the chalet right now. I can see you. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and since they've been here, they've been so wonderfully blessed and, and, and helped that they want to get married. And they felt that uh, with, the, with the, now the removal of a lot of boundaries and so on, they wondered if they could get married here tomorrow morning in the communion service. And we felt we needed to ask you. Well, actually, when you get difficult decisions like this, it's best to go into committee. And I wonder whether we could actually ask the other members on the team if we could have a quick committee meeting. Well, they, 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 they trust your judgment. Yeah, really. but who's going to do it? Pardon? Who's, who's going to do it? Well, yeah. they, they thought that you looked rather priestly. Oh, yes. And uh, godly. Yes, and you I could, the least to do. And he has the least to do here, absolutely. I mean, where's he been while we've been up here every evening and at main seminars and optional seminars, sitting around with his little walkie-talkie, shouting at people all over the site? In a, in a godly way, of course. I think, it, I think it would be okay to do it, as long as we can get a registrar to be present. Well, my name's Reg. Hi, Reg. <laughs> Yes, but no, they but did we, actually particularly ask we, we you need a because license they register. feel a fellowship of older people would, 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 would help them. And um, <laughs> I still. <laughs> yeah, let's get on with the next bit. Come on. <laughs> you're not you're not taking this seriously, no, Mr. Not, Chairman. Uh, no, actually, it's Stu Pascal's coming over tomorrow morning, and I rather defer to him because okay. he's been working the over 55s this week, right. and I think it would be more in his course. Okay. Look, I know that you're going to be very disappointed watching this program here, but we'll be praying this evening and we'll be seeking to shift Mr. 
Simpkins to see if he can be a bit more generous with time tomorrow morning. So go to bed, don't worry about it. We'll look after it for you, you'll be all right. <laughs> Shall we move? <laughs> they feel bad, Mr. Simpkins, they feel bad. Mr. Simpkins, uh, spring harvest, does it just like roll on from one year to another? Do you just assume there'll be another one next year and one after that, one after that? I think a lot of people think that spring harvest is, as it were, a mighty machine that just goes on and on. And uh, indeed, uh, the event next year is being planned. And we already know what the subject is going to be, God willing, when, if we're going to be here, in that sense. Uh, the, the site is booked, and we've got four weeks in Skegness and four weeks in Minehead. But it's not a sense that we just go on and on. And in the past years, we've always said we'll not go further than the intimation or the uh, direction that God has given to us. And in that sense, we thought, well, is this the right way to go? We ought to be stopping and just seeking God's face and trying to understand what he's saying for us. And in the past three or four months, the executive has gone away with some council members and just prayed together, sought the face of God as to the direction of the future. And we're meeting again in about three or four weeks' time following this event to know and understand exactly what he has for us for the future. Now, don't get the impression that spring harvest is going to stop or anything like that. But what we want to do is to make sure we're in the center of God's plan and purpose. Whatever that is, whatever he's got for us. And so it's not a sense of just going on and on and on. We just really want to hear from God as to the subject, as to the direction that he should be taking us. Now, I, I know you've not had the meeting yet, uh, but uh, what, what sort of thing do you think God might be requiring of us? I mean, there are so many things going on the site. Why, why change anything? It's, it all appears to be going so well. A few minor changes here or there. Why, why have you felt this need to seek the Lord together? Well, I think so, so often you can get into, as it were, the normal, the repetitive type of thing. It worked last year, it worked the year before, and it's worked this year. But sometimes things do grind and uh, depreciate and, and go down, and we thought, well, come on, we really do need to know. And sometimes you just look and say, well, this is a smaller week. Is there something that we could do in the fourth week of spring harvest whereby we could help and assist other areas within the church, put on a special interest week for somebody. So constantly we need to be looking and developing. Now I've already heard from two or three people this week, uh, wow, we're here on our own or we're here as a family, we're going back to our church, we want to bring a coach load back next year. Yeah. Now what, what, what do they have to do for that, Colin? Do they have to wait till adverts appear in the press or? Well, everybody will have received a booking form when they came in. If you didn't receive a booking uh, form, can you wave your arm? Well, that's not bad. That means the stewards have done an excellent job and given everybody... <laughs> that means that uh, over 1,200 in this hall have got a booking form. And uh, we find that over 60% of people actually will book from this booking form to come back next year. And if you want to actually bring a group with you, you can make contact with Spring Harvest. There's a number in this booking form, and they will give you all the details that uh, are <laughs> uh, g g g g going on. And um, I am listening. It's all right. No, I am listening. No, you can't read my notes. Oh, I no, see. No, no, this is Just checking. Just checking. We do have these problems. We've got the gunge thing. It's coming right down there any minute now. <laughs> just, just getting positioned. <laughs> You're nervous about this, aren't you? But if you do want to bring a group, go along to the Spring Harvest Office, Information Office, or phone up the office, and they will send you full details. They'll take you through and help you with all the information, the support, and backup through the whole year. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, That's quite it. seriously, we are very grateful, Mr. Thank Simpkins, for Thank all you, Rachel. Do. Let's show our appreciation, Thank you. shall we? I said we'd do it anyway. Oh, right. Okay. Right. You want to do the poem? Yes. Well, what have, what, have you, what, have you, what have you learned this week, David? I've learned to believe. And uh, you've put this, this 
into a helpful testimony, haven't Funny you? Funny you should say that, Joe. Okay. Right. I've got it here, and it's called I Believe, and it was actually written by a mate of mine, Stu Henderson, from Anfield. And it's based on the creed, if you know it. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Although I have problems with the word Father, what happens if he was violent, drunk, or just not there? Maker of heaven and earth and of things visible and invisible, which is a bit of a puzzle because if something exists but is invisible, how do you know when it isn't there? And in one Lord Jesus Christ, I believe Jesus was a great cook, oh, to be given a fish prepared by him. I believe in imagination. Imagine. No imagination. Hard to imagine. God of God, light of light, by whom all things were made, who for us men and our salvation came down from heaven. Presumably that means women as well. I believe in women. So does the Church of Scotland. But that's possibly to spite the English General Synod. The Anglicans sort of half believe in women, providing they can set up a working party to have discussions of, for a conference at the end of which a report is to be issued, confirming that the matter is under consideration. Methodists and Baptists acknowledge women, but not so as you'd notice. <laughs> Brethren and Pentecostals are constantly surprised to discover that an object such as a woman actually exists. <laughs> but Charismatics fully accept women, providing they can edify worship and, and don't, uh, you know, lots of swirly dancing and, and don't wobble unnecessarily. I believe that if I believed in reincarnation, I'd come back as anything but a woman. A cow pat or an, an escalator, perhaps. At least in both those categories, you don't stay trodden on for very long. <laughs> I believe in women. I believe in women. I do believe in women. But, but leadership is male, and leadership is stale. Leadership is frail. I believe leaders should be servants and servants should be powerless. I believe all the leaders should spend part of their training playing on merry-go-rounds and building sandcastles. I believe the church should be a refuge, a, a swing park, an embrace. I believe at the, at the beginning of the next international healing crusade at some conference hall cathedral that the platform party should begin worship by doing farmyard impressions. <laughs> followed by a competition to find the best yodeler. I believe in absurdities such as kangaroos and cockatoos and saying the word bobble. I believe that people who in deep sincerity go forward for healing and do not experience it and are then told by the leader it's because of their lack of faith should then be able to belt that leader. And then minister to him about his sin of using emotional blackmail as a means of control in public meetings. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and bullying sick people isn't one of them. I believe in the supernatural, mysticism, and the raising of the dead. It's just that there's not much call for it in our midweek prayer meeting. I have problems with people who proclaim that there's a man at the back suffering with lumbago, when in fact it's a woman in the gallery with cystitis. It all seems so confusing, so speculative. For that reason, I don't play one-armed bandits either. Not that I have problems with gambling. After all, what are investments but balance sheet tic-tac? The revenue from these little flutters has kept some Christian organizations going for years. I believe prosperity teaching is a rabbit's foot, being waved at the reality of poverty. I believe we need a theology of money, and I believe in confession. Not positive or negative, just confession. I believe propaganda is an ideal value, uh, ideological valium. Propagandists are, are minor birds, excellent mimics, but don't expect them to say anything original. I believe in doubt. I believe doubt is the process of saying, excuse me, I have a question. Propagandists hate questions. And in doing so, detest art. I believe in art. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I believe we should seek the lost, unhealed child in all of us, cradle it and say, you really are forgiven. And I look for the resurrection of the dead. 
No more hearses or deaths, graveside curses, and the life of the world to come. I believe, I believe in quite a lot. Thank you. Together. It's an interesting thought, isn't it, actually doing that in church on Sunday morning? How many of you go to the kind of church that I go to, that if you put your hand up, they say, yes, you may go to the toilet? How many of you go to the... Okay. This is a dangerous place to be. It's interesting to think, actually, that today is Thursday, and Sunday is coming. And you're going to go back there as such servant hearts, not telling them how to live their lives, but in the middle of the night, you're going to post those cassette tapes you're going to buy tonight through their letterboxes anonymously, aren't you? Of course, the, the more frightening thing, I guess, they're in real chaos here. Do you know they got so excited they broke a jug? Do you know that? Well, and the person who cleared it up is our stage steward who's been with us for the last three weeks, Lucy. Good. That's enough, I want to be out by 10 o'clock, so you need to pay your attention. No, we'll do better than that. So here we are, it's Thursday, and Sunday's coming, and just that little moment causes us to say, now that is going to be interesting. The more fearful thing is that Monday is coming. And you just can't wait to get in there, can you? Whatever you do from nine-ish to five-ish, five days a week, you just can't wait to get in there and start trying to turn conversations from the weather to the second coming in some meaningful, <laughs> distinctive way, is it? I mean, you're going, to be, you're going to be putting literature in people's desks, driving people mad. And I think the real challenge for us as we meet here this evening is to figure out however our faith can work during those days when we're not here. Uh, it is Thursday and Monday's coming. We are here after a week of considerable spiritual refreshment. Yes? We have, uh, God has been very good to us. We've learned about faith. We've exercised some faith. We've looked at revealed faith. We've looked at saving faith. Was anyone there on the morning? <laughs> the following morning we did enduring faith. You almost believe it. And finally we did living faith. Which book of the Bible did we look at in our Bible? Galatians. So we've looked at how faith and law works. We've looked at all our schools, we've done some celebration, we've done some worship. The issue is, how does this work out when we arrive to do whatever we do with the rest of our week? You see, the big question is, how does all of this relate, not only to what we do when we get together to worship and pray together, Sunday by Sunday, or whatever we might do during the week, but how does it relate to what we do with the rest of our lives? I mean, do we consider that the work, when we go to it, is a kind of necessary evil? You know, that the real life is what we do in the church when we worship together and learn from God together and read the Bible together and express loving care together? Is that what we consider the real world? And sort of, and work is, is a necessary evil. You know, we go out of a Monday morning, you know, with, with the words of Walt Disney's Seven Dwarfs ringing in our ears. I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Okay, is, is, is that all there is about? Is that, the, is that the, the sort of the motivation simply to find, you know, I hate this idea of work, it's on my back, but how else am I going to pay the bills or find some way to exist? How do we find a way to see that God is relevant in our normal lives? Let me tell you that during my many years when I've worked in Christian organizations and Christian initiatives, I've interviewed many hundred people for work in Christian organizations. And time and again, I found people, when I asked them the question, why do you feel you might be called into this? The answer is, I cannot understand how God makes sense in my ordinary working life. I get up morning by morning, I go to bed night by night, but that period in between, I cannot figure 
where God is in all this. I know he's with me. I know I've got to share my faith where I'm there. I know I've got to live a consistent life. I know that if my job is helping other people, it makes some sense. But many people don't perceive their job to doing any value other than giving them some money in order to survive. And people time and time again tell me, I do not understand how what I do from Monday to Saturday or whatever it might be makes life, makes sense in my ordinary life. And that's the challenge I want us to look at tonight. Our subject tonight is faith at work. How faith can make sense in our day-to-day -day lives. And this isn't just something for those in, in paid employment. If you're in paid employment and you are doing something seemingly mean, meaningful, like being a nurse or a teacher, perhaps you'll feel some value in what you do. Although increasingly, the more nurses and teachers I talk to, the less that is true in our contemporary society. But if you're doing something that seemingly is worthwhile, perhaps there's some meaning to it. But for the rest of us, we can struggle to see wherever God works out, other than us, looking for opportunities in the workplace to lay God on someone when, when we can creep up and they may not even notice. And this is relevant too, as whether you're a student, you know, you can always spot a student, they're always taking a year out, that's my experience. Um, I love students, particularly those who are not part of my family. Uh, <laughs> with five children, they are going to be students forever, I've decided. So, but as, as you are studying, what are you working towards? Simply a means to put bread on the table and a roof over your head so you can go and do those spiritual things in the rest of your life. What are you actually working for? What are you going to do as a result of it all? What is the value of everything you're going to do in terms of how your life has meaning for the rest of it? And there are others for whom you, you have, you're outside of the workplace. Um, if ever you ask a woman, does she work or not, you need to say, are you in paid employment? You understand the significance of that if you are a man who asks a woman if she works or not. Because there is an enormous amount of work that goes on for us day by day, which has no paid benefit to it at all. Mostly done by women, but not always in our society. We seem to be moving towards a point where we've got this sort of, the new man has got this great idea, the new man in our society has decided women will also work, uh, but also will keep the same share of the chores in the household as ever before. I know that I can remember speaking at the church I was used to be a member of. Um, they didn't throw me out, I just relocated. Um, and I, at least that's my story and I'm sticking to it. No, it's not, it's true. And I remember I was, I was explaining the gospel and I was talking about sin and I suddenly, as I was preaching, suddenly realized that that little light on the hoover, you know, anyone got a light on their hoover? You know? I see that hand. And there it was, and, and I realized that, that the light there is a way of exposing dirt. It was a great illustration. And in all innocence, I said, that when I get up in the morning and I, I hoover the main living room before I go off to work, <laughs> and they did exactly that. There was this ripple of disbelief, and I couldn't figure whether it was an imagination that I wouldn't know where to put the plug, or whether this was sort of in this particular church where sort of real men, you know, don't eat quiche and don't hoover. And I told the story, I think, because it was also a way of saying, hang on a minute, we need to share our values. We need to know where we are as people. The stereotype that is often imposed upon us means that we need to understand how work is not only meaningful for those who get paid for it, but work is also meaningful for those who don't get paid for it. You talk to my, talk to my wife, Rosemary, she'll tell you all about it. She was so weary with people stopping her in the street with these surveys and questionnaires saying, what job do you do? She invented one. She said, I'm a domestic engineer. <laughs> That's very confusing if you're a researcher and trying to put someone in a little pigeonhole. Um, and she, she said to me, she said, how long must I seek significance in my life when the most significant thing I seem to do is simply wipe a baby's backside? How many more of these do I need to do for significance? It was, my memory goes back to when I was working in advertising as in my early 20s. I sat opposite a young guy roughly my age called Martin. Our job was to make sure that advertisements appeared in newspapers or on television. We didn't write them, we didn't design them, but we were the people who made sure that the space having been booked, that the writers did their work on time, the designers did their work on time, the filming was done on time, the, the pictures were drawn on time, the whole thing together happened and arrived where it needed to be. And if it didn't get there, they'd have a little space reserved, which said, you know, this space was reserved for 
Martin. And it was, a ter- it was a terrible fear. You spent all day under huge pressure, running up and down stairs, trying to persuade cre- creative people to do things they didn't want to do. And it was, it was a high pressured job. And I remember one morning Martin came in and he was looking particularly grey. I said, what's up? He said, oh, he said, you won't believe it. I got home last night, he said. Got home last night and I said, hi honey, what sort of day have you had? And she said, it has been terrible. And of course, across his mind, all sorts of images round round, you know, you know, the house had burnt down, you know, three children had died. I mean, what, what could, I mean, her face was grey, terrible. He said, honey, what happened? She said, the rhubarb boiled over. (laughs) I said, Martin, this is a bad deal when the most significant thing in someone's life appears to be as trivial as that. And I don't tell the story to make it sound as though what happens at home is trivial. I say it to make the exact opposite point. For some of us who seem to be doing significant things through our lives fail to realize that some of those who are in partnership with us or who simply are in unpaid work have roles which are very insignificant indeed, seemingly to them. So how are we going to find some significance? How does the gospel relate to all this? You may ask what credentials even I have to talk about it. I've been in Christian work for many years. The answer is I need to tell you until 18 months ago I was VAT registered. That ought to be some sort of credential to be with you. Uh, I've worked in Christian organizations which which have a business base. In other words, I've always lived by faith but never by gifts. And there is a significant difference between the two. I've found myself working with people um, who, uh, who uh, have to deal with issues such as cash flow and uh, employment loss and employment laws and health and safety rules. I've dealt with all the kind of muck in Christian organizations that many of you dealt with in secular organizations. Uh, that isn't to say that the money you give here and through your church isn't carefully used, but people are people. And I do know what it's like when it's all tough. I even got to the point where I decided I'd do a management course, and the management course was called How to Handle Difficult People. So don't think that just because you're out there in the real world out there, that some of us aren't fighting the real world here, because it's not as easy as you may think dealing with people on that basis. So how do we begin to get a handle on making sense of our faith in our normal working lives? Well, you could turn to Genesis chapter 2 for me, or you could look at the verses which will appear on the screen from time to time. And the first one is this, Genesis 2.15. And it says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and take care of it. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and take care of it. What does that tell us? It tells us that we were created to work. We were created to work. And though it says the man, it wasn't just men who were created to work. Because verse 18 goes on to say, I will make him a helper. Now that's not just someone to be a a sort of a a provider alongside. The context there, and we haven't got time to go into it, is someone who was in equal partnership with. And so male and female were called to work. God created us to work. Work is our calling. Some people treat work as though it was the result of the fall. You know, work is a punishment. God's plan was we were to sit in the garden all day, not eating the apple, but sort of laying out in sort of, you know, Garden of Eden deck chairs, soaking in the sun, doing nothing. And then we seem to have this sort of imagination that then as a result of disobeying, God said, I'll get the rascals, I'll make them work. That isn't the way it was at all. God's initial created plan was that humankind, all of us, should work. The problem is that the fall, our rebellion against God, meant that it became toil. In other words, work would be easier if it wasn't for the toil, if it wasn't for the fall. If it wasn't for the fall, I would not have needed to do a course on how to work with difficult people because they wouldn't have been difficult people. Do you understand the difference? So toil is a result of the fall, but work isn't. Work was God's glorious plan. He made us to be in the garden and work. And I've got to tell you, I really have struggled with that concept. I've really, particularly as a young, dynamic Christian, someone who was sold out to God, the sort of guy who would stand on a soapbox on street corners and tell the world exactly what was happening. Because it seemed to me that gardening was such a useless exercise. I mean, I thought, why not just let the weeds grow and use that as an object lesson of the fall? I could say, well, I'm sorry, neighbors, you know, this is the result of sin. 
And I thought that would, that would be really useful. But as, as I looked at it, I realized that the problem is to simply say that, that gardening, that work of that kind, is, is, is outside of God's plan, is to fail to realize what God has got in mind. That, that I needed to understand that, that work was God's idea. And that though gardening seemed fruitless and purposeless, maybe like many of the jobs that some of us are involved here. As I said earlier, if you've got something seemingly meaningful like you know, law or teaching or whatever, you might be able to say, well, that was, that's worthwhile getting out of bed. But some of us get up on a week by week, day by day, month by month, year by year basis, and what we do seems to have no reason or purpose whatsoever. To me, that's the kind of equivalent of gardening. Just, just, just let it grow. Let's do, let's do something worthwhile. Let's preach. Let's teach. Let's evangelize. Let's do something for God. Let me tell you, if work was God's plan, then working is doing something for God. Even if it seems to have no spiritual overlay to it, even if we're not seeing people come to Christ in our workplace, doing something for God that he has planned for us to do is spiritual. And one of our dangers is that we divide our lives into boxes. There's the nice spiritual box, you know, praying and reading our Bible and going to church and going to spring harvest and helping people and going to the home group. Now, that's spiritual. And there's another little box which is secular, which has no sense and doesn't relate to God at all. And it's things like working and working and working and working and working. Now, what does God call us to do? If God put us on earth to work, how can you say that work is not spiritual? If you're doing the things that God has called you to do and created to do, which is work, then that surely is spiritual. And the great danger we've got is we are kind of rabbit hole Christians. You know, the, the real spiritual environment is the rabbit hole, where it's all safe and cozy and we're among the clan and we get on nicely. But we, what we do is that we put our head up out of the rabbit hole on a Monday morning and we scamper through life for the rest of the week as quickly as we can, avoiding any contact with anything meaningful, and dash back down the rabbit hole when it's all over, back into what we're really designed for. And we're not rabbits designed to live in the rabbit hole. We're people designed to live in the workplace, even though it may not seem to have any meaning. The meaning is there because that's because what God has called us to do. Work is our calling. Work is our calling. Work is spiritual. That has a significant implication to our society because not everyone works for a number of reasons. And not to be able to work means to deny people their right in creation. And we need to hear this and take it very seriously as Christians if we're to work out our faith in a realistic way. Consider, for example, those who are unemployed because their abilities do not <coughs> suit the conventional workplace. Those who are not able to work because their abilities do not suit the conventional workplace. I was walking around the exhibition and someone passed me a copy of Groom's News. It talks, it's John Groom's, which care for people. It describes a project on the back page of a horticultural nursery in Cheshunt. Uh, it provides opportunities for uh, purposeful employment and supplies retailers, garden centers, and high street stores all over the country with flowers and plants. It's a Christian organization. And it says this, their goal is to provide employment and training for people who have learning or physical disabilities. It talks about one young man called Gary. Gary has dyslexia and learning difficulties, and they've made finding employment hard for him. But Gary has now been working at this place for seven years and is a key worker. Gary says, I'm looking forward to another challenging year ahead. I believe this is one of the most significant responses to the Christian gospel I've seen in a very long time. It stands in equal standing alongside great evangelistic initiatives, prayer initiatives, and everything else. Why? Because it is helping people who would otherwise be disadvantaged to find their God-given calling to be in the workplace. We are privileged here at This Week in Spring Harvest uh, that quite a number of folk for whom finding meaningful employment is very hard because of the circumstances of their life. We're delighted to have you with us. 
I just believe the great challenge to us as a church is that we've had to wait for the government to bring in legislation which has caused people to take seriously how we respond to these people's needs in the workplace when we would be doing something biblical and Christian if we were taking initiatives to make sure that they had the kind of work opportunity that they need. And those of us who are in employment, those of us who are in, in employment need to be looking for ways in which we can help people come into work in those sort of situations. The second tragedy of those people who are denied work because they're victims of economic manipulation. Victims of economic manipulation. What do I mean? Because there are economic policies often enacted in this country which says the more people there are out of work, the more we will deflate wage rises and the more we will keep inflation going and the more that the haves will have and the more likely they are to vote for us and be satisfied. And we need to understand as Christians that is a denial of the Christian gospel. Every time there is a political policy which uses people as fodder and keeps them out of work, it's a policy which is denying their birthright to work and we should stand against it with all the power and muscle and prayer we possibly can. Thank you. For too long we have divided our Christian initiatives into, into spiritual issues and failed to see they impact the whole of our life. The good news applies to the whole of our life and we need to be working at it. And the third area, not only should we be concerned about those who are denied employment because, of, because they're not ideally suited to the workplace, not only should we be concerned about those who have been denied employment because of, of the manipulation of the market, we should also be concerned about those who've been, who are unemployed because they are the idle rich. Any idle rich here? There's a lot of idle poor here. I count myself among <laughs> idle rich. There are those, beware of the promises that say, work with us for a few years. You will get rich and you will walk the beaches of the world. Some of the great lies that go out there that, 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 that offer these things. And the sad thing is that some of us actually sort of almost adore, almost hold in high regard those who now have so much money they no longer need to work. It's as much a denial of how God has made us to be unable to work because of circumstances in life as it is to say, I've created so much wealth that I do not need to work again. To me, the, the, the great evil of the lottery is not that a few people might spend a few pounds here and there which could be used to other causes. It's the promise it holds out to millions of people every week which says, if you get lucky, you need never work again. I believe that's a statement of blasphemy that we need to understand that work is our heritage and our privilege and we should be enabling to do it. I want to take a few minutes to look at one man in the Bible who worked and to draw four simple lessons for us having built the principle that work is our heritage, our privilege, and should be our joy, despite the hard work involved. I don't know who you'd turn to in the Bible if you wanted someone who, who was a working person, who wasn't a king, who wasn't a priest, who wasn't a prophet. I've chosen, uh, I've chosen Joseph. I won't read the nine chapters of his life. I think you're probably familiar enough to know that Joseph was the guy that they wrote a musical about. So at the very least, if you've seen the musical, you know where we're going. But he was the man at 17 who the father adored him, gave him the multicolored coat, treated him with favor. His really nice brothers decided that they were so jealous they'd do him in. When he came out to the fields with them, they threw him down a pit. And then one of his brothers had a nice idea. He said, look, um, let's, let's, let's not kill him, let's sell him into slavery. And so Joseph is sold into slavery in Egypt finishes up in a, in, in a house of a man called Potiphar, a rich man. He faces sexual harassment, stands for truth. As a result of that, goes to prison. In prison, he prophesies and uses his spiritual gifts. But the promise of being looked after, he's left stranded. And some two years later, finally finds his way to the palace. I want to trace just four simple lessons that come from the pit, Potiphar's house, prison, and the palace. Because I believe these are things which will help us make sense whether we're students working towards a working life, whether we're those who are praying for those who are in work because our years have now passed us, or whether we're those who are in work or trying to find work to understand how it all works out. The first simple thing is this, is that 
Joseph was thrown into the pit. It, it was a water hole, it was dry, which was just as well because the Bible doesn't tell us whether he could swim or not. Um, but he, he was down there and then sold into slavery. Someone who had had all the love of his father, the care of his father, the safety of an environment, suddenly finding those brothers that he thought loved him, those that he thought respected him, had abandoned him, betrayed him, and sold him off. We don't clearly know what he thought then when it happened, but we do know what he said 20 years later when he was reunited with his brothers and his father. And the next verse that goes on the screen tells you exactly what he said. In Genesis 5, uh, Genesis 50, he says this, to his brothers and family, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good in order to accomplish what is now being done. Joseph's present circumstances then could only be understood in terms of what would happen in the future. Now, I have no way of knowing whether when Joseph was thrown into the pit and sold into slavery, whether at that time he was able to say, this will make sense because I have faith and confidence that my God will turn it for good. I have no way of knowing whether he said that. I do know from the Bible that he could look back on where he was 20 years later, survey his history, and possibly say, I may not have understood it then, but I understood it now, that what you tried to do there, what you did to me, was, was intention for bad, but God has used it for good. I think there are some clues in Joseph's character in the way that he responded when he arrived in Egypt and was faithful to God, that it's even conceivable he understood it then. And some of us tonight feel we're in a pit. Some of us feel that we've been sold into slavery. It might have to do with the workplace. It might not have to do with the workplace. It may have to do with the paid employment we're in. It may have to do with the fact we have no paid employment. It may be to do with the unpaid employment we work that somehow we are trapped within circumstances over which we have no control. I do not know your situation. I wouldn't begin to give examples, but it's very reasonable that there are many in this large room tonight for whom when you hear the words and the concept of being thrown into a pit, maybe even the concept of being betrayed as a result of being there and sold into slavery, no longer having control of your own destiny, no longer being able to remove yourself and get out where you were because the pit is too deep to climb out and the slavery is such that you can no longer get your freedom, you feel yourself identifying with Joseph. But I have to tell you that the Bible makes it clear that we may never understand why now. We may never understand why in the future. But if we're ever to understand, it's because we need to know that whatever has happened to us may seem to be something which is harming us but God will always work it for good in order to accomplish what will be done in the future. The Bible doesn't say that Joseph felt it at the time, but there's every reason to believe that he could have done. Did God cause his circumstance? No, God didn't cause them. Did God allow his circumstance? Yes, he did. Did God cause your present situation? No, he didn't. Did God allow your present situation? Most certainly he did. Why did he allow it? To accomplish something in the future which you cannot dream of or conceive of now. You see, we crave protection from present pain, but God has purposes for us which we often do not understand. God intends it for good. And that's a kind of lighthouse that we need to steer by. That is a fixed point that we simply cannot ignore as being true and real. Let me illustrate that to you. I stood some, just under a month ago now, sat rather at a funeral. My wife sat next to me. It was a funeral of the most beautiful seven-year-old girl you could ever wish to meet. Lively, vivacious. She had simply dashed across the road under a wheel of a car, under the wheels of a car, a week earlier. And as we sat there, some three to four hundred of us in a, in a church, hardly a dry eye in the place, just my, my wife and I were just distraught for the family. We heard the mother very simply stand and say, you all know me as a very ordinary woman and a very ordinary mother, 
and I'm currently living through everyone's worst nightmare. But I want to tell you what I know to be true about heaven is seeing our family through now. I tell that because this is a living illustration how what is true, even though we can't see it or feel it or touch it, significantly affected the way she coped. What is true about your current circumstances, however deep the pit, or however much you feel locked into slavery, what is true, what we need to steer our lives by, what we need to cling on to being the truth, is that whatever you may feel, God will use it for good at some point in the future. Do you know what we would have done if we'd have been on the edge of the pit? You, you arrive there, and there is Joseph down the pit. And I know what most of us would have done. We'd have dashed to the local Christian bookshop, and we'd have found a nice card with a fluffy kitten on it. And we'd have lowered it down on a string, and, and Joseph would have opened it, it would have said, all things work to good for those. <laughs> and if I'd have been Joseph, I'd have said, uh, hang on a minute. That verse is one of the most misunderstood verses in the whole of Scripture. Because when we dangled it down, and if we'd have used it the way most of us used it, we'd have been actually trying to say to him, it's going to be comfortable sometime in the future. You'll find yourself a nice house to live in. You know, slavery is going to be better. Because we interpret the word good as though it means comfort or ease. We've all been there. You fail your exams. What do you, someone says, oh, all things work to good for those that love God. Uh, that means that there must be a better job around the corner. You miss the train. Oh, all things work to good for those that love God. That means you would have probably got into a carriage with someone who smoked badly or had awful armpits or whatever people <laughs> might do. Do you understand? We interpret Romans 8.28, for all things work together for good, as though the word good means for our convenience or our betterment in, in, in material terms. Why do we never read the next verse? Why do we never read verse 29, which says that the good is to mold us and shape us to be like Jesus. Romans 8, 28, the word good there is that the things that God brings into our lives or the things that God allows to happen to us is so that they can be used to mold us into the character of Jesus. That's the good. That's the good. 8, 28 is all about the good is making us like Jesus. The bad circumstances we've got God's promise to you isn't that it's going to get physically or materially or emotionally or circumstantially better. His plan is to use these circumstances to mold our character to grow the fruit of the Spirit in our lives so we can grow to resemble Jesus. And if you look at the life of Joseph, you can see how he expressed those kind of qualities in his life. That's crucial for us to understand. Let me say one thing. I'm not talking to you in theory now. It's very important you should understand this. I'm not describing to you a country I have not visited. Do you understand me? Very often, if you were to ask me what Australia is like, I could only tell you because I've read the guidebooks. If you ask me about the Isle of Wight, I could describe it with great detail because I've been there. If you're in a pit, I want to tell you that I've been there. Joseph's experience has been mine over the past few months. I had dreams like Joseph saw a Christian radio station launched in London. And in November, I was asked to leave. It's not appropriate I go into the details of how and why, but I want to tell you that I felt like Joseph down the pit, abandoned and sold into slavery. And I stand with some of you tonight, knowing that when I leave here uh, tomorrow, I will find myself on Monday with no clear understanding of my future, other than that what has happened to me God will use it for the good of his purposes. So please understand that I'm describing a country that I visited. God will use it for good. Someone said to me that what has happened to you must be a great test of your faith. I want to tell you that in God's goodness and grace, I have not doubted God for a moment. I've had severe doubts about some of the people who <coughs> claim to serve him, but I've never doubted God for a moment. I wrote back and said, this is not a challenge to my faith. This is a challenge to my character. And that's true of every one of us who feels tonight that we're in a pit or sold into slavery. How are we going to allow God to use these circumstances to mold and shape us so that we become more like his son? That's act one. Act two takes us to Potiphar's house, the workplace. 
Joseph is there, working away. And he finds himself faced with moral compromise. The easiest thing that Joseph could have done would have simply, I was going to say, laid, laid down on the job. That was basically what was being offered. Moral compromise was the easiest thing that he could possibly have done. Instead, he was there doing the very opposite, face to face with moral choices. And we, we read in, in Genesis that he was, he was harassed and chased and persuaded day after day and finally ambushed. We read that Joseph takes a stand. Uh, verse, chapter 39 and verse 9, Joseph says, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God. What does this say for our workplace? Wherever we are, in paid employment, in unpaid employment, seeking for employment, going through our student and study lives, into retirement, whatever we may find, there are constantly times when we are faced with moral compromise, very often through the actions of others. And we need to stand against those, not only by maneuvering out of them, not only by finding ways to put ourselves out of those situations, not only by coughing and muttering and changing our shift, but actually realizing that in those situations we need to do as Joseph did. We need to describe them as wicked and say that God would be unhappy. Do you understand? We're not even called to say, oh, I'm a Christian, I don't do things like that. Because that somehow doesn't cut ice. That means that if, you are a, if you're not a Christian, it's probably all right, but for you as a Christian, it's not. There's a vast difference. There are people out there who are breaking the Ten Commandments, and we're simply letting them get away with it because, well, they don't believe in God and it's all right. There are wicked things that are happening in our workplaces in terms of injustice, selfishness, uh, backbiting, prejudice, exploitation, dishonesty. And God's call to us is not simply to say, well, I'm a Christian, I don't do things like that. We need to find ways with grace and gentleness to name God and to name wickedness. Do you understand me? Because we need the population to understand there is a God who holds them as well as us accountable. And I don't believe that until we start naming sin as sin in the community and naming God as God in the community, we will ever see the kind of breakthrough in revival that we're praying for. You see, we don't only pray down revival, we work it out. And for many of us, it's very much easier to simply change our shift or find some way to work out of it, and we're too busy making sure we don't use, you know, that we pay for the photocopies and don't use too many pencils, when what we should be doing is, because of the winsomeness of Jesus in our lives, because we're being molded and shaped towards his character, because there's love and compassion and mercy flowing through our veins, because we're known in the workplace as people who have integrity and love and compassion and care for others, that we need at times to make sure that when we confront sin, we name it as wickedness, and we make sure that people understand that God would not be happy. And for some of, that's, uh, some of us, that's going to be very tough, and we're going to need all the help we can get. But some of us here tonight know exactly what I'm talking about. You know of the dishonesty and injustice and impurity and sheer wrongdoing that are happening at a variety of levels, and we simply cannot, as Christians, acquiesce to it anymore. We're going to need all the courage that God can give us if we're going to work out the revival we're talking about. The third place we find is Joseph in prison. Joseph in prison. And without going to in, into all the details of the, of the dreams that he interpreted and then everything that he did, you find that finally he has his spiritual breakthrough. Finally he sees the hope of freedom at last. The chief cupbearer says, I'm getting out tomorrow and I will remember you. And two years later, Joseph is still in prison. Because as the, as the passage of scripture simply says, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And some of us feel very forgotten tonight. Some of us feel very forgotten and overlooked. Almost orphaned. Left stranded. Believing that God has forgotten us. Some of us have had God's promises implanted into our hearts months, years, decades ago, and we're still waiting for God to act. It's important to understand God doesn't only have plans, He also has timetables. God doesn't only have roadmaps, 
He also has timetables that work them out. And some of us need to wait patiently for God in the way that Joseph learned to be patient with God as he was trapped in prison. And finally, we come to Act 4. And here is Joseph finally in the palace. Suddenly, riches and honor and power are his. And do you know what? I think it's at that point he became the most vulnerable. I think that Joseph was more tempted, more liable to fall, more liable to compromise with all that money and power and influence in his hands than when he was back in the prison or back in Potiphar's house as a slave. Because if it's hard for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven, then surely it must have been very difficult in, of indeed for him to be pure and upright and clean. Power corrupts. And the challenge to some of us here, just a few of us here, is that we need to learn how to handle the power and the riches and the special position that we have. Because of whom much is given, God will require much. Not many of us stand in those status. Many of us regard ourselves as very poor, ordinary, average people. But some of us will have special opportunities to have power and authority and dignity and status. And we need to be those who walk humbly and gently and with great righteousness and work on that basis. Uh, and there in that setting, the people that Joseph worked with had an assessment of him. They had an assessment of him. Promotion was on the cards. And they said, who could do this job better than Joseph? Who could do this job better than Joseph? For he is a man who is obviously filled with the Holy Spirit. Who could do this job better? He's obviously a man filled with the Holy Spirit. How was Joseph marked out as a man with the Holy Spirit in that situation? Very simply, if you read the text, it describes him as being faithful. In other words, he had sheer grit and stickability and also that he was discerning and wise. Now, those were the gifts of the Spirit that God gave him to do his daily work. You know, in the church, we spend a lot of time over the last few years desiring that we may be filled with the Spirit, and rightly so, pressed down and running over, continually filled and overflowing, so that what? So that what? So that we can worship Jesus better? Wonderful. So we can have a greater intimacy with him? Wonderful so that we can do the job in the church God's called us to be wonderful. But the Bible also talks about us being filled with the Spirit so that we can do the kind of work in the daily workplace that God has called us to do. And some of us, that's a totally new concept. Again, because we put our lives in boxes. The work of the Holy Spirit is for what? For church things. What do we do when we go to work? We drag ourselves off, we go through the daily grind, we come back, and then we get real with God again. That's not the picture we've got here. Joseph was so obviously filled with the Holy Spirit that the quality of his life and work was noticeable in the workplace. And friends, I believe that whether you're a student, training for work, preparing for work, whether you're someone in paid employment or unpaid employment, whether you're someone who is now in retirement but praying for those who care and being useful to where you are, we don't only need to be filled with the Spirit in order to do those things that we perceive as Christian and religious, but filled with the Spirit so that the people in the world outside can see a demonstration of God's character where we are day by day. Do you know the greatest challenge to the church is how we can be seen to be the church at those times when we do not meet together? That's the greatest challenge we've got. How can we be seen to be the people of God singularly and together at those times when we don't meet together for religious purposes? Because the, kind of, the amount of time in a week we meet together is very small. And we won't solve the answer by having longer meetings. That's why I'm closing in any moment. All right? We won't solve the problems by having more church meetings. What we will solve the issue is by living the Jesus life where we are day by day filled with the Spirit. We need to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit in our daily, working, toiling lives. That's God's plan and purpose. God, please help me to do my job well. May your Spirit fill me so much 
that the positive qualities of your life overflow to me day by day. Work is God's plan. It's not bad news, it's good news. Joseph knew God had the big picture in mind. Joseph was faithful when the times were hard. Joseph honored God when he made moral choices. Joseph avoided self-pity when the chips were down. Joseph waited patiently for God's timing. Joseph handled riches, honor, and prestige with integrity and dignity. And Joseph was honored for his likeness to the one who made him. That's God's plan for us as we leave spring harvest and work out our faith day by day. May God help us to do that in his lovely name. Amen.